All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome, and please do mute your mics. Happy Wednesday. Uh, first off, uh, you're aware that there was a session in uh, Geneva today on racism. The Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, addressed the Human Rights Council today in its session on racism. She noted that, as the Secretary General said, the, positions, uh, the position of the United States Nations on racism is crystal clear. The scourge violates the United Nations Charter and debases our core values. The Secretary General, she noted, has called for dismantling racist structures and confronting the systemic ills of institutions. In the UN, he has launched a one-year process to address these grave staff concerns. The most recent trigger for the recent protests, the Deputy Secretary General recalled, was the killing of George Floyd in an appalling act of police brutality. But the violence spans history and borders alike across the globe. She said that the United Nations has a duty to respond to the anguish that has been felt by so many for so long. Equal rights are enshrined in our founding charter. Just as we fought apartheid years ago, she said, so, we must, so must we fight the hatred, oppression, and humiliation today. Also today in Geneva, the Human Rights Council looked at the situation in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In her opening remarks, Michelle Bachelet, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, highlighted progress achieved in the country to open up political space. She also noted measures taken to end corruption and embezzlement of public resources. Ms. Bachelet expressed deep concern over the deterioration of several situations of armed conflict in the country. She said that around 1,300 civilians have been killed in conflicts between armed groups and government forces over the past eight months. The High Commissioner urged the government to intensify efforts to end the increasingly brutal attacks and promote peaceful coexistence. She also said that it is essential to extend state institutions and services throughout the country in order to stop attacks by armed groups and ensure respect for rights, including the right to life. The Secretary General made remarks today by video to the China-Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID-19. He said that as COVID-19 spreads around the world and across the continent, Africa has responded swiftly. As of now, reported cases are lower than feared, but he warned that much hangs in the balance. The Secretary General cautioned that the pandemic is a grave threat to Africa's progress, potentially aggravating long-standing inequalities and heightening hunger, malnutrition, and vulnerability to disease. He stressed that it is essential that Africa receives the solidarity and support it needs. In responding to COVID-19 and all our current global challenges, from climate change to lawlessness in cyberspace, we require unity and solidarity, he said. He added that no country is safe and healthy until all countries are safe and healthy. The Secretary General's full remarks are online. And in South Sudan, the UN mission there tells us that it is concerned by reports of renewed clashes and increased tensions near Pibor. In the past few days, many civilians have ex escaped reported violence in Gumaruk, in the Jongle region. The mission has reinforced its base in Pibor so it can carry out extra patrols and provide security for civilians. The mission is also in contact with the leaders of the groups involved in the fighting and is urging them to restore calm and come together for mediation and reconciliation. Over the past five months, violence has escalated in Jongle, resulting in the death and injury of many civilians, as well as communities being displaced and homes being destroyed. Not only is the fighting causing immense harm to civilians, but it also risks pulling organized armed groups into violence that could unravel the fragile peace agreement. The UN mission urges the unity government to protect all citizens and to appoint governors in 10 states so that they, they can work to prevent further conflict and build peace. The humanitarian coordinator for Yemen, Liz Grande, has expressed her condolences to the families of civilians killed in Monday's attack on a vehicle in Shada district, Sada governorate in the north. Initial field reports indicate that at least 12 civilians, including four children, lost their lives. Fighting has continued in Yemen, despite the Secretary General's call in March for a global ceasefire. More than 800 civilian casualties have been reported due to fighting since January, with several incidents involving multiple civilian casualties recorded since the end of May. In addition, Ms. Grande warned that humanitarian funding is running out, affecting millions of people who depend on the food aid and the health services that we provide. A funding deficit of more than $1 billion remains, following the 2nd of June high-level pledging event for Yemen, 
where dollar donors pledged $1.35 billion out of the $2.41 billion needed for essential humanitarian activities through the year. Turning to Syria, our humanitarian colleagues say that they are increasingly concerned about rapidly rising food prices in a country where more than 11 million women, children, and men urgently need humanitarian assistance. Food prices have more than doubled in the last year, rising by 133% across the country. According to the World Food Program, 9.3 million people across Syria are food insecure, an increase of 1.4 million people in just the last six months. Another 2.2 million more people risk becoming food insecure. Food prices have soared in the past few weeks with informal exchange rate rapidly deteriorating. In May, the cost of a standard food basket increased on average by 11% compared to April, a number which had already increased by 16% from March. Humanitarian organizations, including WFP through food assistance, are addressing needs at a massive scale. From January to March, the UN and partner organizations have delivered assistance to an average of 6.2 million people each month, including life-saving food for 4.5 million people across Syria's 14 governorates. Turning now to the UN system and its efforts related to COVID-19, in Serbia, there are more than 12,300 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and more than 250 deaths. Nine UN agencies, led by the resident coordinator, Francois Chacob, and guided by WHO, are supporting the country's health response with special focus on the most vulnerable groups. The UN team has mobilized two points, uh, sorry, has mobilized $26 million, which has been used to purchase medical supplies and is also being used for logistics, including flights to deliver life-saving items. The UN team is also supporting Serbia's efforts to communicate on COVID-19, reaching some 6 million people. Messages have been tailored for different groups, such as refugees, asylum seekers, and people at risk of statelessness. Uh, some 45,000 people, including women, youth, the Romani people, persons with disabilities, and the elderly, have received hygiene kits and humanitarian aid from the UN with the Red Cross and NGOs. The UN has also gathered 7,000 volunteers to support local government's efforts to prevent the spread of the virus. Through a UNICEF-backed online platform, 500 adolescents are offering peer support to cope with the pandemic. And the UN, together with the World Bank and the European Union, is supporting the government to assess the social and economic impacts of the pandemic. And some related positive news. The World Health Organization welcomed yesterday the initial clinical trial results from the United Kingdom, showing that dexamethasone, a corticosteroid, can be life-saving for patients who are critically ill with COVID-19. According to preliminary findings shared with the WHO for patients on ventilators, the treatment was shown to reduce mortality by one-third. For patients requiring only oxygen, mortality was cut by about one-fifth. The benefit was only seen in patients who are seriously ill with the virus. The benefit was not observed in patients with milder disease. WHO said that it is looking forward to the full data analysis of the trial in the coming days. The agency added that it will coordinate analysis to increase the overall understanding of this intervention. The World Health Organization clinical guidance will be updated to reflect how and when the drug should be used. Universal child benefits, such as unconditional cash payments or tax transfers, are crucial to fight child poverty, yet they're only available in one out of every 10 countries worldwide. That's according to a new report published today by UNICEF and the Overseas Development Institute. The report says that universal, universal cash benefits for children in middle-income countries cost just 1% of GDP and would lead to a 20% decline in poverty across the entire population. UNICEF's executive director, Henrietta Four, said that now, more than ever, as the economic fallout of COVID-19 threatens to roll back years of progress in reducing poverty, universal child benefits can be a lifeline. She added that they can protect vulnerable families from deepening levels of poverty and deprivation and can save countries from catastrophic societal and economic impacts. And today is the World Day to Combat Desertification and Drought. This year's theme is Food, Feed, Fiber, and focuses on changing public attitudes to the leading dri driver of desertification and land degradation, humanity's relentless production and consumption. Land degradation currently affects some 3.2 billion people and 70% of the world's land has been transformed by human activity. In his message, the Secretary General said that the health of humanity depends on the health of the planet, and he calls for scaling up land restoration and nature-based solutions for climate action, 
and the benefit of future generations. You'll find that online. And immediately following my briefing, our friend Rima Baza, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly, will brief you, so please stay connected. And tomorrow, my guest will be Amr Dawoodi, the UN World Food Program's Director of Operations and COVID-19 Corporate Response. He will brief you on WFP's air and logistics services for COVID-19 humanitarian and health response. And that is all I have uh, to read. And uh, now we'll turn the floor over to your questions. So uh, 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 please uh, raise your hand uh, by, uh, by saying in the chat room that you have a question. I already have one question from Majid Gilly. So Majid, you're free to ask. Thank you, uh, Farhan. Uh, I have uh, two questions. The first one is about uh, Syria. Today, um, today, U.S. imposed uh, new sanctions on Syria. Uh, what is the Secretary General's position about, uh, about this? And in general, uh, when it comes to the sanctions, do you think the U.S. and European Union should lift the sanctions on Syria? And my second question is about developments from Iraq. Turkey launched um, uh, a military uh, operation uh, in, uh, on the border with Iraq, uh, which Baghdad protested. Uh, it targeted, the operation targeted more than 150 Kurdish uh, targets. Uh, and uh, today, in the last 24 hours, uh, ground troops from Turkey entered the Iraqi borders um, what is the UN's reaction for this uh, recent military development? Thank you. Well, uh, to take your questions in order, first of all, concerning uh, the CSER Act, uh, as you know, uh, the UN has been closely following the issue of sanctions programs relating to Syria. Uh, as you're aware, the Secretary General has made a global appeal for the waiver of sanctions that can undermine the capacity of the country to ensure access to food, essential health supplies, and medical support in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as to sanctions programs relating to Syria, we note the public assurances made by relevant states that their sanctions programs do not affect humanitarian supplies nor target medicines, and we welcome their commitment to fully apply humanitarian exemptions. Um, as for uh, your second question concerning uh, the situation in Iraq, uh, we are following the developments closely uh, and uh, it's clear that uh, that uh, the parties would need to follow maximum restraint. Um, and regarding um, uh, the situation between Turkey and Iraq, uh, it's clear that uh, we would want uh, those uh, two countries to resolve the situation uh, peacefully uh, through dialogue and negotiation. Okay, um, let us see who else has a hand up. Um, uh, James Bays is next. So, James. Farhan, obviously very concerning the situation regarding uh, India and China. Can you tell us what communications the Secretary General has had, whether there have been any other communications with senior UN officials? Uh, I don't think uh, it's uh, appropriate to, to detail the, the various communications. Uh, but we are making our messages known. Uh, we've made clear that we're concerned about the reports of violence and the deaths at the line of actual control, and uh, we urge both sides to exercise maximum restraint. And uh, certainly we've taken positive no note of the reports that the two countries have engaged to de-escalate the situation. Uh, Abdelham. Thank you, Farhan. Um, I want to go back to the report of the children in armed conflict. And that item is called uh, Israel and the State of Palestine. I am looking for a justification why they slammed both entities together, why Israel and Palestine came under one item. When they talk about, for example, the uh, 1,565 children where uh, their rights were violated. There were only six Israelis. When they talk about killing, there are 32 Palestinians and one Israeli there. When they talk about detention, they're all Palestinian and none of the Israelis. Putting them together under one title has a malicious intention to put them in one basket and say this is the number of uh, children 
with large square violations. Why not separate them? I need a justification of Mrs. Virginia Gamba. Uh, on that, um, I the report itself explains its methodologies and its uh, and I would simply refer you to the text of the report, which explains all of the various violations that it records and is uh, and is essentially self-explanatory. Uh, beyond that, in terms of why it's written, uh, we, we put that, um, the contents, the work that is being done, the research that's being done in, in the hands of Ms. Gamba in her office. She described the work that she did and she also, I believe, answered your questions on, uh, the, uh, and uh, if this answers questions on the Israeli-Palestinian parts of the report uh, in her briefing to you on Monday. So I would simply refer you to that uh, but uh, the Secretary General, uh, as you know, uh, the report goes out in his name, and he fully supports uh, the work uh, that uh, the team has done on it. Uh, Benny? Um, so on the, the speech to, uh, to the to Human Rights Council, how could anybody, how does Amina Mohammed or, or the Secretary General or anybody take seriously the Human Rights Council opinions on racism when its own members, you know, are famous for pretty much uh, preaching their own sins as somebody else's. Just as an example, Venezuela today uh, raised an issue of police brutality in the United States, which is related to racism, obviously. Venezuela, I mean, can we take this seriously? I mean, is that uh, even uh, credible? Benny, uh, there's no rule that says that in order to take issues seriously, we must ourselves be perfect. Uh, the UN has made it very clear that uh, that all countries have problems with racism. This is something that the Deputy Secretary General said in her own remarks today, that this is a global problem. Because yeah, but you uh, mentioned specifically uh, hold, on, two me, uh, hold, hold, hold on, please let me complete the thought and then you'll go. Sure. It, in order to deal with these issues, we ourselves have to take a, a critical look and a hard look at what each country uh, does. Uh, and we've made it very clear. Uh, there's no political ideology, no national uh, capacity that is immune from racism. This is something that all societies have to tackle. And one of the ways that they need to tackle it is by dealing with it honestly. Uh, now, you, you were saying? I was saying that she specifically mentioned just two countries, the United States and Britain, uh, and, and no one else. So, I mean, there is clearly, this is triggered by an event in the United States, which does uh, point to racism, but I mean, when when you, when this Human Rights Council is doing its, I mean, China is about to become a member, Uyghurs, you know, I mean, it's it's just it defies credibility, and since the the, 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 the focus is on on the United States and Britain in her case, I don't know, it's it, it kind of like loses. Credibility, I think. I think you're actually reflecting your own personal opinion and your own personal uh, biases on this topic. Uh, I mean, my basic point still stands that every country, the, even the countries that are allotted in other aspects or countries with uh, different um, uh, constitutional protections concerning uh, the treatment of races, every country has to look at this seriously because all countries have had these problems. Amina Muhammad spoke actually very eloquently this morning about how her own personal experiences have shaped her. And, and she's had to deal uh, with uh, problems having to do with the color of her own skin throughout her own life. The Secretary General is very aware that there are problems here at the United Nations itself. And so he is also uh, encouraging uh, staff to look at this issue. And uh, uh, as you know, He's initiated a program so that, that the UN itself deals with racial issues. Uh, the bottom line is the problem will not be solved 
from running away from it or from refusing to see it. And the problem cannot be solved by saying, until everyone is good, it, it doesn't merit discussion. Uh, okay, um, so uh, after that, um, uh, I believe Evie has a question. Uh, thank you, Farhan. It's sort of a follow-up question to both uh, Majid and to James. Um, is the Secretary General um, actively trying to engage the Chinese and the Indians, the two most populous countries in the world? And on the same matter is, I mean, on a different matter, is he trying to engage Turkey and Iraq because we are talking about an incursion into the sovereignty of another country. Uh, certainly on both topics, we'll be engaged at various levels. Uh, I don't think I'll uh, be able to state in either case uh, we, what specific officials we're contacting at this point. Uh, but yes, we, we have our various concerns and we're reaching out at various levels to make sure uh, that in, in both cases, uh, maximum restraint is followed. Uh, and um, Majid has another question. Uh, yes, Farhan, I just wanted to ask about, uh, in, you know, Security Council still hasn't adopted a resolution or a common position with regard to, to COVID-19, this global pandemic. And we are seeing every country uh, is dealing with it by their own. There is no global consensus on how to deal with this. And in the beginning, we see we saw this urgency from Secretary General to have such a position, uh, a common consensus among the council members and others. Um, uh, has the Secretary General gave up on the council reaching a, a, a consensus on this? Especially, we are not seeing much um, urgency at the council level to have uh, a resolution with regard to COVID-19. No, he hasn't given up. Obviously, it's been frustrating. And the Secretary General, if you've uh, seen his recent interviews, has made clear his frustrations at the lack of, of international unity in terms of dealing with COVID-19. It has been uh, frustrating and has made uh, our ability to deal with the pandemic on a worldwide scale uh, much more difficult. But he continues uh, to hope that the Security Council will come together and we do need to hear from the Security Council whenever it can do so. Uh, Abdul Hamid. Thank you, Farhan, again. Uh, the statement issued by 50 UN human rights independent experts about the annexation of Palestinian land to start from July 1st, by the way. Have you seen this letter? Did the SDs share the views of this letter? It includes, it enumerates the number of human rights uh, violations that committed by Israel against the Palestinians. It goes into about 20, at least 20 different uh, areas of uh, violation. And it also put the blame on the United States for protecting such a country. Is that country qualified to talk to people about the human rights and about credibility and about what, sh what this country should do or what should it? Well, as uh, as regards the views of the human rights rapporteurs, the, the, their views are are in their own independent expertise, and uh, I have nothing further to say in terms of comment about that. Uh, the Secretary General's own views and the views of Nikolai Mladenov and the other senior officials dealing with this are clear. We have been opposed uh, to annexation. We're opposed to unilateral steps that harm the two-state solution. And as we get uh, closer uh, to the start of July. If uh, there's anything further uh, that needs to be said from our end, we will say it. But uh, you'll have seen what we've said, uh, including in the briefings to the Security Council and in the remarks by the Secretary General, and uh, we stick to those. And unless I see any further questions, I will now turn the floor over to Rima Baza. No, uh, hi. Uh, oh, oh, wait, one more. I, I did have a comment. Okay. I I feel that in America, the real people who have a right to a bigger voice 
are the indigenous Indians who were eradicated by the new settlers in America over the years. I think historically, those people really have a right to, to, to be unhappy and feel that they're not equal citizens. Going back to Africa, unfortunately, I think personally, this is personal, we have to go back to history where in Africa, the chiefs enslaved their own people. And then unfortunately, commercially, with uh, not quite legitimate whites, arranged for them to come to the New World, America, and be slaves. But it started in Africa, unfortunately. Uh, th thank you, and your point is noted. Uh, I'd like to remind you, though, Gloria, that these are uh, briefings at which the reporters are to ask questions. But yes, your point is noted, and of course, uh, we do have a special rapporteur uh, who reports to the Human Rights Council on Indigenous Affairs as well. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Reem Abasa. Reem, the floor is yours.